Hello and welcome to NCC Group's Crypto Pals Guided Tour. My name is Eli, I'll be your guide. In this video, we'll be starting on Challenge 12 from Set 2, which is one of the first really dramatic attacks in Crypto Pals. This attack allows us to use an ECB encryption oracle to perform ECB decryption, which might be sort of a surprising result if you haven't seen it before. The premise is similar to the last challenge. We have a partially chosen plain text. Whatever we choose, we'll have an unknown fixed suffix appended to it. This is what we want to recover. Uh, to start out, we don't know the contents of the suffix or its length. Our goal is to use our control over the prefix to figure out the contents of the suffix. Now, there is an attack description provided at the bottom of the problem statement, so let's step through that. We'll start by determining the block length. We can do this by sending incrementally longer and longer messages to the encryption oracle until we see that the length of the ciphertext increases. As soon as that happens, it tells us the block size because it must just be the amount that the ciphertext's length increased by. And so now we know the block length, but that's not the only length that we can figure out now. Uh, first off, since we've been incrementing the length of the plain text by one, the moment that we see the ciphertext length tick up, we know that the last block of the padded plain text is a full block of padding. And just in case you don't believe me, here's a quick proof of that. We know that the ciphertext and the padded plain text must have the same length, and whenever either length increases, the other must increase in tandem with it. In this case, the length of the ciphertext just went up by 16 bytes, and the length of the message went up by one byte. So the length of the padding must have gone up by 15 bytes. Now, since the padding length is bounded by the block size, which in this case is 16, it follows that the padding must have just gone from length 1 to length 16. But more than the length of the padding or even the length of the plain text, what we're really interested in here is the length of the secret message, which is appended to our chosen message before padding and encryption. And in fact, we now have everything we need to compute this length. First, we take the ciphertext length, reasoning that it's equal to the padded plain text length, and then we subtract 16 to trim off the padding bytes. Then we subtract the length of our chosen message, and we're done. This value will come in handy later. Moving on, the next step of the challenge is to detect that the encryption oracle is using ECB mode. We've done this several times in the earlier challenges, so I won't dwell on it here again, but if you don't know how to do this by now, then maybe check your own solutions for challenges 8 and 11, or go back and watch my video for challenge 11 where we discuss ECB detection in detail. Now, step three is where we finally start getting to the good stuff. At this point, you might have some intuition that this attack will rely on some sort of exhaustive search, because at some point most crypto attacks do reduce to that. And the goal is simply to give ourselves as small of a search space as possible so that we can search it quickly and easily. As such, the attack proceeds by setting our chosen prefix to be just one byte short of the block boundary, like so, with the consequence that exactly one byte of our oracle's secret suffix will be included in this first plain text block. Now our setup is complete and the attack begins. The core idea of the attack is fairly simple. This plain text has exactly one unknown byte, and there are only 256 possible values for that byte. So we'll just loop through all those possible values, passing each one to the encryption oracle, and we'll keep going until the ciphertext block that we get back from the oracle is equal to the ciphertext block on the left that we're trying to decrypt. And once this condition is met, we will know that the final bytes of these plain text blocks must be equal as well. And just as a note for the mathematically inclined among you, yes, we do know this for certain. In fact, it follows straightforwardly from the fact that our block cipher is bijective between plain text blocks and ciphertext blocks. Once we've recovered the first byte of the secret suffix, we just trim a byte off of our input message so that now there are two bytes of the suffix in our plain text. Of course, the first one is now known to us. And it turns out that we can now use the exact same strategy as before, recovering the second byte through exhaustive search once again. This search proceeds just like the first one, except, of course, that we have to include the result from our first search as the penultimate byte in this one. So we don't control the penultimate byte's value, but neither do we need to. We just need to know its value in order for the attack to work. That might seem like a trivial point, and it kind of is, but bear it in mind anyway, because it'll come up again soon. Anyway, at this point, you're probably seeing how this will shape up. After recovering the second byte, we can get the third one through the exact same process, first collecting our target ciphertext like so, then iterating through candidates, which I'll represent by giving the target byte a little spin, like this, until we find the correct value, and likewise for the fourth byte, and so on, but what about the seventeenth byte? After all, each step in our attack starts by chopping a byte off of the start of our chosen prefix, but now we're sending in the empty string. We've run out of bytes to chop. The challenge statement glosses over this part of the attack algorithm, presumably so that you can have a bit of fun discovering and solving this problem on your own. So I'm going to take a moment here to encourage you to do just that. It's not too far of a jump from what we've done already, so if you're not sure what should come next here, pause the video and take some time to think it over. And if you want a little hint, take a look at what happens when we do this.
at this point, the idea should probably be pretty clear. We're going to launch the exact same attack we just ran, but this time we'll target the second block of the ciphertext. This might be a bit unintuitive, after all, we don't control any of the bytes in this plain text block, but as we discussed earlier, we don't need to control them. We know them, and that's enough. So, proceeding as before, we recover the second block one byte at a time as well, and eventually this process will recover the entire secret suffix. In fact, we can optimize this slightly. You might notice that we're actually encrypting the same messages over and over, and since we're just cycling through the same 15 inputs to which a fixed suffix is being appended, Really, there's no need to repeat these oracle queries. We can just submit them once and catch the results. We do still need to query the oracle many times for each search step, but this is still a slight improvement. This might be useful if, say, oracle queries are slow or otherwise expensive, or if querying the oracle is somehow noisy and we're, say, trying to reduce our odds of being detected by minimizing queries. Of course, the attack is still fairly noisy. Uh, 128 queries to the oracle per byte recovered on average, but that's all the more reason to take every improvement we can get. Now we can run through the remainder of the attack quickly, filling in the results as we go. And there's one last thing I'd like to mention before moving on, just in case you were wondering. This secret message is not the one from the challenge statement. That one was a bit long to fit comfortably on screen, so I decided to save it for the screencast and to use a shorter one here instead. This message is a quote from one of my favorite artists, Del the Funky Homo Sapien. And now that we've recovered this message, let's decode it from ASCII. And we see that it reads, I brought all this so you can survive when law is lawless. Which is a lyric that you might recognize if you happen to be listening to the radio some 20 odd years ago. And with that, I ain't happy, but I'm feeling glad to be moving on to the next part of this video where we'll switch gears to implementing this ECB decryption attack. Which, as the challenge statement says, is the first of these scripts that will break real crypto. That's pretty exciting, so let's get started. Alright, let's go. And once again, I have gone ahead and taken the liberty of typing this out in advance so that rather than sitting through watching me type, you can sit through my explanation of what I type. So here we have uh, some basic, you know, global constants. And we'll just walk through these functions one by one and then get to our main block at the bottom. So first up, we have the Oracle. This works a lot like the one for Challenge 11 did. We uh, create a closure here. Within that closure, we have the key and the secret postfix stored. So this secret postfix actually never leaves this scope. This scope here. It, it's actually not visible to any other part of the code, and likewise with this key. So you know that if these are recovered, they are recovered through the proper channels, <laughs> namely crypto attacks, rather than, you know, through an, any other method. Here we have the oracle. Again, it's fairly simple. It just takes a plain text, appends the postfix, pads the result, uh, encrypts it with ECB, and returns that. And that oracle gets returned from the make oracle function. So this is an oracle factory, essentially. You can think of it that way. Next up, we have this first function that operates on the oracle, find block size and postfix length. We described what this is going to do uh, near the start of the animation for this video. So this should be totally unsurprising. We're going to start by encrypting a single character A. We could also have encrypted the empty string, I guess, but it's fine to start here too. And then we're going to count up from there encrypting successively longer and longer messages until we notice uh, the length of the resulting ciphertext changing. As soon as the length of the encryption of our extended message is longer than the length of our first message, then we will know the block size is the difference between their lengths because the ciphertext must have increased by exactly one block. We will furthermore know that the postfix length is the original length minus i. And this is a little bit of cute algebra here because um, we are, we essentially compute the postfix length as L2 minus uh, block size minus I, but we know that L is L2 minus block size already. Um, so we can just do L minus I here to save ourselves an operation. And then we break out of the count here. Um, these two lines here are not strictly necessary, but look what happens if I comment them out. The type checker gets very mad at me because it doesn't know that uh, these values have been properly initialized. So if we have these asserts here, then uh, we can help the computer catch up to what we as programmers know to be true, which is that uh, this loop will successfully populate their values, and then we just return the result. And I really, by the way, do recommend having these sorts of static checks on your code, even if it does require a little bit more work, adding asserts here and there. The benefits just in terms of like the errors that you catch really quickly are tremendous. It's so worth it. I really, really highly recommend it. 
Anyway, moving on, we have our uh, detect ECB function. This is totally trivial. This, again, you know, works the same as it has always worked. Uh, we just pass a bunch of bytes to the oracle, check if the first two blocks are equal. If they are, we return true. Otherwise, in this case, we're just going to raise an exception uh, because we want to bail out immediately if this test fails. We do not want to go any further, um, but of course it won't fail. And then finally, we have our guess byte function. This one works just as you would expect it to. This is just like we discussed in the uh, animation for this video. We loop over each possible value. Actually, I should start with the arguments here. So we have a prefix. This is expected to be 15 bytes long, assuming a block size of 16. And uh, this basically just leaves us, you know, all the bytes but the last one. Or rather, it accounts for all the bytes but the last one. Then we have our target ciphertext block right here. And then we have the oracle that we're going to be querying. And we're going to loop over each possible value for the last byte. We're going to turn that value into a byte, append that byte to the prefix to produce a block of length 16, which is message here. And then we're just going to pass it into the oracle, get the first block of the resulting ciphertext, and check whether it equals our target. If it does, we're done, and we return. This, by the way, just as a super quick aside, is actually twice as fast as what's described in the... Uh, challenge statement, which wants us to make a dictionary of each possible last byte. Um, by aborting as soon as we found the correct one, we can skip about half of the loop on average. Um, and we also have lower memory overhead, so it's a win-win. Although either way will work, really. But anyway, yeah, and if this uh, search ever fails, then we raise an exception immediately because something has gone very, very wrong. And now, just to, uh, just to put this all together, we have our main block here, and I thought about making a main function, but I don't really think it's necessary. I think that it's fine sometimes to have a longer main block, especially in a case like this. We start out by making the oracle, and then we analyze the oracle to get the block size and postfix length, which we print out, and we assert that the block size is what we expect it to be. And then step two here, we detect that we're using ECB. And so, yeah, I mean, you can, you can follow along if you want to read the steps. But this is where we go a little bit off script here um, because we're going to be sending... So we discussed at the end of the video that we can really only make 16 queries to the Oracle to get all the ciphertexts that we need to know the blocks that we're going to be attacking. Um, and that's what we're doing here is we're going to send 15 bytes, then 14 bytes, then 13, and so on down to zero bytes. Um, and we're doing that by, you know, looping from zero to 15 and taking 15 minus n. We could also futz with... Uh, the step on this range, but personally, I think that this is more readable. And uh, then we do this, and this, by the way, <laughs> it's just absolutely monstrous. I would not blame anyone for not uh, intuitively knowing what this does, so let's look at it in a terminal. So this is the code we're interested in, and we'll start, we'll start slow here. So what we have is... So the, the, the ciphertexts that we're going to get back are going to look something like this. I mean, obviously, they're not actually going to look like this, but basically the gist is it's going to be a list of byte strings, um, and what we want our iteration order to be is we want to iterate over this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. By that, I mean we want to iterate over the first block of each ciphertext, uh, and then over the second block of each ciphertext, and then over the third block, and so on. Um, so... How do we go from this to that? Well, the first thing we can do is if we do, and this might look a little bit magic, but check this out. That gets us most of the way there, and I think this is actually a really cool trick. Um, this this essentially unpacks each of these into separate arguments to zip, which allows you to uh, iterate over all of the lists uh, in parallel, essentially or in lockstep, or however you want to put it. Um, and so that gets us the first element of each of them and the second element of each of them in consecutive order here, um, just how we want it. But we do need to flatten this. So suppose we do something like this, which is a, uh, I don't know what you'd call this, a nested list comprehension. Um, personally, I've always thought the syntax for this is a little bit bonkers. Um, it's it's hard to read, especially because we're referencing a name over here that we only define over here. And even after you read the first part of the four, you still don't know what Y is, and it's just a little hard to read. Um, this is, in my opinion, one of the uglier parts of Python, but what are you going to do? And that flattens the list for us, which is quite nice. Um, and then we just have to uh, truncate it to our postfix length. 
so yeah, this is essentially what's what's happening up here, um, but with a little bit more uh, pomp and circumstance, I guess, in this case. But the point is, at the end of it, we know that uh, we can recover one byte of the postfix per block that we attack, and so we just take that many blocks, and we start from the start and work through them. Um, so we're going to start with a plain text of 15 bytes because we're essentially, you know, priming this attack with 15 null bytes that we, we passed to the very first ciphertext in this list. And we're going to iterate over the blocks, and for each block, we're going to run our guess byte search function, and it's going to give us one more byte of the plain text. So we can just build up this plain text gradually over time, and once we're done building it up, we can cut off those null bytes at the start, uh, because, you know, those aren't actually part of the plain text, and then we can go and print the result. So let's, uh, you know what, let's, let's be a little more theatric with this one. Um, is, do we have to go to time to get the sleep function? I think, I think that's what it is. From time import sleep. Right on, yeah, that is defined. So let's uncomment this and sleep 0.1. And now let's go ahead and run this and we can watch the, uh, <laughs> the Hollywood style uh, decryption of this suffix um, because we're recovering it one byte at a time so if we do a dramatic little pause here then we can you know watch it watch it be built up from nothing slowly uh so ah geez i forgot to download that file um so <laughs> let me do that really quickly or wait no it's not a file to download it's actually just uh a uh String. So I'll just do that. And there we go. Now this is how this is how hacking's supposed to look. <laughs> oh yeah. Where's my movie contract? And there we go. That's the full string. And we can see that it reads, rolling in my 5-0, with my rag top down so my hair can blow. The girlie's on standby, waving just to say hi. Did you stop? No, I just drove by. All right, well, that does it for Challenge 12. Thank you for joining me. I hope you found this helpful. Maybe you learned something, and I'll see you in the next one.